Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to our next edition of the Property Bike Podcast. When you hear the words Sydney's Upper and Lower North Shore, we typically think of the broad tree-lined streets full of jacarandas, exclusive private schools, luxury mansions with impressive street frontages in suburbs like Barunga, Warrawee, Pimble, Roseville and Linfield. These Sydney suburbs are highly sought after and turnover is relatively low, which means there's strong competition amongst buyers. It's an area that families find their dream homes and settle for often over 30 years until the kids leave home. So what makes this market so attractive? Who's moving in and who's moving out? And what trends are we seeing in the buyer pool? And how do you find good quality homes in such tightly held markets? Well, to answer these and many more questions, today we have Matthew Bourne, Managing Director of McConnell Bourne, to provide some sage insights into this North Shore market. Welcome, Matthew. Great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, Rich. Glad to be here. So we have a little tradition when we start mm-hmm. our podcast, and I throw you a, a thought of the week. Just want to get your spin on this one. And this week it is from Martha Beck, who says, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. What do you take from that quote? I would say, Rich, that we're, how we do anything is, is from the, the person on the outside looking in is then the perception of how we do everything we do. So really, I think that uh, we've got to be in our best behaviour <laughs> at all times. Yeah. But I think our behaviours and our actions yeah. at the end of the day, what, in anything we do is really what is perceived from everything we do. Excellent. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, the way we make our toast, the way we make our beer, the way mm. we answer the phone. It's, exactly. You can get little insights into people. I think it's very much about habits. I mean, I read a great book a few years ago called uh, Atomic Habits. Um, Funny that, yeah. Brilliant book. And I think this, is, this quote speaks to that in mm. the way you approach anything is, is how you value that. You know, a lot of people are carefree. Other people are meticulous and OCD and there's lots of yep. people in between, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think you're right. And um, you, you, those, when you talk about habits, it's the habits of open homes and listing presentations, by management work, whatever we do. Yeah. We are yeah. habitual beasts and creatures, mm. I guess, in one well, sense. My view is good habits will set you free. So. Absolutely. There we go. Well, let's get into it. A um, mm. couple of questions for you. How did you first get into real estate? What, what was your first job like? In yeah, wow. Estate? So that's going back a while. So 1994. Yeah. Um, got in, very interested in architecture. In fact, I probably should have been an architect. I think, going back, looking well, at it. It's a good marriage, isn't it, with it real is. estate and architecture? Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. Mm. So I was very fascinated by property, uh, and especially architecture, and I think the area here, I grew up in St. Ives, knew the area very well, and I think looking, uh, so I went for jobs right across Sydney and um, could have worked in, in Randwick, ended up here in, in sunny Linfield, working um, in a franchise group then, Richardson and Wrench, mm. great job, great people who own the business, and mm. I was just attracted to, yeah, the architecture to the area, mm. Um, just thought it was beautiful and just love looking at property, mm. you know, just yeah. a, I think it gets into your blood, it's a passion. Definitely, yeah. yeah well, so. it's funny enough, I grew up in Linfield myself, just down yep. the road in East Linfield and ah, okay. uh, went to Kalara High, so yep. know the area very well. Lots of friends in Kalara and St Ives when I was in my teenage mm. years, so mm. I know it very much like you. And like you, I, same thing, I, I really fell in love with property and I really wanted to work on the buy side and that's, that's why I created my company. But, yeah. um, but tell me more about your business in particular. What what suburbs do you cover and uh, I guess what areas you, you've got coverage over? Yeah, predominantly, look, when we first started that, we were very much just a one office situation and we were based here in Linfield. So we were Linfield, Clara, Roseville and Gordon, I guess. And then we, we did expand and we ended up in Marunga and St Ives and, and Gordon. Um, and I guess we've done a complete reverse of all that and come back to the one office scenario. Mm-hmm. It's funny, in my whole, I guess through my career now and talking to many, many people, who have had many, many multiple offices, a lot of them just come circle back to the one office. Mm, mm. And as this industry has progressed, we've become more digital, we don't need to be on the street corners, etc. Yeah, yeah. So um, so the business started out in in 2000, and, uh, it was 2000s of property management business, effectively. I was still contracting to the sales of R&W. Mm. Um, then I took that leap of faith and I ran this business out of my third bedroom for about a year. Good on you. Yeah, 
quite quite um, peculiar. Mm. Went into a serviced office, then went into a shop front, and then we started about two thousand and four. Started to grow from that point onwards. Brilliant, yeah. yeah. And how did how was COVID? Did you have multiple offices before COVID, and then come back here more recently yeah, we did. and consolidate? Yeah, yeah, we had three offices pre COVID. Yeah. Uh, went into COVID. That was obviously a very challenging mm. time. Uh, but realised, I guess, with tech and, and digital platforms, etc., that we probably didn't need all those offices. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we centralised back to one office. It's interesting. I, I walk around lots of different cities, and and I. You know, you don't see as many window shop fronts of real estate. You know, the mm. traditional just a, a, a printed colour sheet of the property for sale versus the digital display. I mean, so much more is digital these days. Absolutely. So it makes I, a lot more sense. I've even noticed recently with some changing of brands around here that <coughs> they've actually taken the window displays out. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? You know, and we've gone from what? A shop corner to, yeah. a, to an office. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And on you're, the first on the, floor. you're on the first floor here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So and how many agents have you got in the team? Uh, well, Rich, right now we're, we've got uh, five of us. Mm. Um, so again, we, we got up as big as twenty five. Mm. Um, we've had some you know some changes over the last twelve months. We've actually consolidated that back yeah, to, to five people. Awesome. Um, so we're now focusing on productivity, um, very personalised service, mm. boutique, family owned. Perfect. And it's working really well for us. That's great. Well, you've mm. certainly got a good name in the industry. So. Mm. Tell me more about the, I guess, the def- unique and defining features of the upper and lower North Shore property market. Like it mm. is a really unique market in Sydney, mm. right? It is. And it's, you know, as I said in my introduction, you've got the, the wide streets. But tell me in your mind, what, what do you think are the unique and defining features of this market? What's interesting, I, you know, being, again, going back 30 years of being in this, this market place and watching uh, through more difficult times what markets actually have done around Sydney. And, and this has been a market that really holds firm and tight and probably one of the markets that doesn't see as big a fluctuations that I would say other markets do. Mm. Main reason being, obviously, the private school belt. I mean, we always <laughs> say it. It's, yeah. it's, we're getting, you know, we sound like we're, we're recording yeah. ourselves the whole time. Yeah. Private schools, transportation, and just the environment yeah. Is, yeah. is first class. So, you know, from Linfield, you're 23 minutes to the city by train. Yeah. You've got all the best schools up and down the, the North Shore line here. Yeah. And just look around at the leafiness of the area. Yeah, right. um, and then, you know, sporting fields, uh, national parks, uh, access to the CBD, North yeah. Coast, yeah. South Coast, it's all yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. it is, it is funnily enough centralised. I mean, it is. the Pacific Highway, which is a bit of a car park some days, <laughs> um, but the train line all follow the ridge line. So That's you've it. got properties to the east and the west, right? Absolutely. And tell me, do you see m- much difference in, I guess, the property market on the eastern side of the yeah. line versus the western side of the line? Uh, less and less we're seeing that issue. Okay. You know, if I go back 20, 25 years, mm. yes, it was this mm. big discrepancy between east side property and west side property. Mm. Um, the values that is, so you could be up as 25, 30% variance, but mm. I'm seeing that now we're actually- It's merging. It's merging, wow, really much is. Mm. A lot of people came to the conclusion, I think, on the, the east side becomes very busy. It's, mm. you know, people are darting through the streets, getting to the train stations, trying to get to the schools, et cetera. And then the west side was a lot quieter. Mm. Then I guess the M2, M7 opened up, a lot of business headed towards North Ride and, and North West. Mm. Um, especially the demographics we've had here, of, let's say the medical fraternity, they didn't want to be crossing over the highway, so they started to opt for the other side mm. of the highway to have better accessibility to those, to where they work. Yeah, okay. So that was fascinating to watch. One of the unique and defining features for me is the larger block sizes. Mm. I mean, you often find families with three, four or five kids. I mean, you don't yeah. get me five kid families these days, but, <laughs> but you still do. Like, and they yeah. want, but they just want that space. They want Correct. the backyard cricket, they want the pool, they want the cabana. Yeah. And I think the North Shore offers that in spades. Um, you certainly got to pay a price for it, but as you described, the leafiness, the, the bush, and it's just that naturalness that you can be, you know, as you say, 30 minutes from the city, but feel like you're surrounded by bushland. It's, it's quite oh, amazing. Totally. And I guess, you know what, not living on top of each other. So yeah, yeah the average block is a thousand square metres. We're not on top of each other, but mm. you're right. When you come back out to the North Shore from the CBD, for instance, mm. then you mm. feel like you're a little bit on holidays. Mm. No. Some people find it a bit too quiet. Some clients really, of ours, they really love the inner west with the vibe or they yeah. love the, yeah. the punchiness of the eastern suburbs and, and the sort exactly. of the go, go, go. But other people prefer that leafy, uh, leafy environment. Well, they do, yeah. We, we did find that very much. Mm. You know, people coming here and going, there's nothing here. <laughs> At least to their yeah. own. That's it. Tell me, how would you describe the state of the property market last year in 2023? How, how would you look back over the last 12 months? What, yeah. what sort of descriptors would you give it? Uh, difficult market. Mm. Um, like the year before, we found the fourth quarter in the in the year very challenging. Mm. Um, we found the beginning. I, look, putting into stages. I guess the, the beginning part of the market of the year, um, first second quarter wasn't too bad. Mm. Um, third quarter we started to see a little bit of shakiness, and I think the interest rates were starting to really catch up with us at that point in time. Mm. Fourth quarter we saw a lot of buyer fatigue, 
We saw the interest rate rise in November. I think a lot of people just sort of sat back and said, let's just wait and see. Mm. Um, so for 2023 and even 2022, we found the fourth quarter very challenging. Mm. Um, But overall, and I think there was an adjustment period there where coming out of COVID, there were property owners that uh, still had in their mind the values of what were through COVID and there needed to be some adjustment here and there going through. It took Mm. a bit of time to to wash through though. Interesting. Mm. And looking ahead, you know, we're at the beginning of, we're now recording this at the beginning of February 2024. Mm. Um, What's your outlook for the year ahead? Are the vendors still nervous to list or are they thinking, you know what, let's just go ahead? Look, like like many, many, over all the years, we've only ever seen between 3 and 5% of the area actually sell, mm. and it's diminished each year. So we are still seeing that supply factor really, really difficult. Mm. Well, and you would be aware that we just got this whole state government strategy that's just been put upon us, and there's a lot of people now asking questions about, okay, what, is, what does that mean? What, am I, what is my property worth? Um, how's it going to impact and my conservation and my heritage listed? Mm. Am I worth more as a residential property or as a development site? Mm. A lot of those questions going mm. on. Mm. But coming into the beginning of the year, we're finding it, I'm finding it buoyant. There's good buyer activity. Um, I think people are confident now that we've got inflation under control. We've got interest rates going to be coming down. Mm. Migration is high. There's going to be demand coming into 2024, mm. for sure. Early stages are saying good things. I know you're not sitting in front of your computer, but mm. do you know off the top of your head the average hold time for a property on the North Shore? Because you say it's getting diminishing, it's getting longer. Yeah. I mean, it used to be, what, 12, 13, 14 15 years. years but yeah. is, it, is it more than 15 years, do you think? Oh, no, I think it, there was a period there where I think it dropped down to around seven or eight years. Wow. I would say now on average, it's probably that school, about that 12-year period of mm. coming into education. Yes. So yeah. we're buying in, kids are going through school, and then we're getting out. Yeah. yeah. So I would say about the 12-year cycle. I mean, we see a lot of downsizers selling their leafy Linfield yeah. homes moving to Manly, you know, yep. or, or the beaches somewhere. So there's a lot of that going on as Pretty well. Much. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk about um, interest rates, and I think that's certainly been holding buyers back. And I think Correct. this year, I uh, put out in my predictions that I think that there's talk now of interest rate cuts. I'm predicting a cut in either July or August. I think mm-hmm. that'll be the first cut. Some are saying it's going to be later. Yep. But I think the cuts um, are going to need to come then to stimulate the economy. I think, I think people are feeling a lot of pain. Everyone I talk to is so conscious of cost of living. Absolutely. Everyone is being frugal, not taking as many holidays, not eating out as much. So I mm. think even at the higher end of town, people are sort of being a bit cautious. Correct. So I think that's holding buyers back. Is there anything else you think is holding the buyers back at the moment? No, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Interest rates, whilst you know a lot of people... It, it doesn't get spoken about too much, mm. I think, in, in certain circles. Mm. I do believe they're biting. Um, I do believe that there's there's not as large a bonus as being rolled out through certain industries, mm. let's say, that they're used to. Yeah. So I think, yeah, look, 13 interest rate rises. And historically, our interest rates are probably not that bad, mm. historically. But, yeah, people are hurting. Yeah, they really yeah. are. I it's interesting. Right. I mean, interest rates used to be around, you know, three and a half, four percent, which meant about a six percent mortgage rate, Correct. which we're at six and a half roughly now. Exactly. So maybe we're a half to one percent above where it should be. Yep. And it's just going through those cycles and it's got to wash through. It does. But, you know, we but also, you know, when you get down to zero point one percent interest rate mm. and you're sitting there at a two percent or three percent interest rate. Yeah. It's like, mm. well, that's what we get used to yeah. really fast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was we, very happy at that rate. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and you, you adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. uh, and then when things yeah. do pop up, you go, oh, yeah. hang on. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it makes it difficult. You've got to keep paying the mortgage down. That's so, it. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Tell me about some of the trends you might be seeing on the upper and lower North Shore. I mean, they're two distinct markets, right? Mm. So actually, where do you draw the line for the upper and lower North Shore? Look, Roseville suburb? is probably our, our yeah, okay. line mm-hmm. in the sand. Yeah, okay. Uh, we go north of Roseville. Yeah, yeah. Um, so particularly the upper North Shore then. What, mm. what trends are you seeing on the, in that market? Look, hev- obviously heavily um, Chinese, Asian influence coming in, buyers coming in. Now, a lot of them, you know, if you listen to the media, there's a lot of um, mainland China money coming in, but mm. in reality, mm. majority of our buyers are up, they're, they're Australian born Chinese and they are upsizing from their current property. It yes. could be an apartment in Piermont, it could be a house in Hurstville, um, but they're looking to get up here purely for their education reasons. Mm. Um, so they're born and raised here, they've been to university here, but their English is just as good as yours know, and mine. Um, now, maybe sometimes they're being helped by mum and dad who do perhaps are overseas. But we are seeing this, you know, I'd say 70% of our buyers mm. certainly have an Asian surname. Mm. We really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, 
could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues, and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help, and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links. And now, let's get back to the podcast. So that's that's very much a growing trend. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there are more units that we're seeing appearing on the Pacific Highway. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but obviously probably what percentage of stock would be houses versus apartments and townhouses? It'd be a 70-30 split, okay. I would say, between yeah. houses and, mm. and that sort of medium yeah. density accommodation. Yeah. Okay. But obviously, as you say, it's the people coming, the Asian buyers particularly, it's also you know, families wanting to, to get their forever home for the, to raise their kids. Correct. So houses yeah. are obviously very, very high in demand. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The big homes, you know, the, mm. the, the tennis court properties, yeah. very much in demand. Yep. Mm. They're, dis- they're diminishing though. But they are. After the Australian Open, they should be in high demand, right? <laughs> they should so. be much, very much in demand. <laughs> you know? they're, they're still very well sought after. And, yeah. and I think there's been a huge growth in that market over the last sort of five mm. to 10 years, mm. the yeah. exponential growth in value, I think. Mm. Tennis courts at one point in time, I think that the value diminished a little bit, but they mm. certainly bounced back. Oh, I used to love going to my friend's place and we yeah. mum and dad have got a tennis court so we can play tennis. It was always That's a it. great yeah. thing to do. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, I guess, tell me more about where the buyers are coming from. Like, are they coming more from the within the North Shore or from the eastern suburbs or the inner west or mm. from other states? Tell me where they're generally coming well, from, do you think? Our stats are showing around 70% of them are coming from the Karinga, or we say the Karinga or Willoughby marketplace mm-hmm. um, or council areas. Yeah. That's predominantly where we see most of our buyers come from. Mm. Outside of that, <clears throat> certainly I would say the Hills District mm-hmm. coming into the area for mm. the transportation, even though their transport links are getting better. Yeah education and transport closer to the CBD. Mm. So Castle Hill, Borkham Hills, um, you know, Cherry, Cherry Brook, those areas coming in here, definitely. Mm. Rarely do we see the east come to the north. Mm-hmm. You know, east stays in the east, the north stays in the north. Mm. And then typically in the west, mm. we yep. would see come through here. Okay. And I guess an area we do, at CBD and Hurstville, mm. but if I was to really you know, I'd lay down and say, it, local buyers 70%, Hills District, in the west, and then CBD. So. I mean, the word aspirational buyer comes to mind because mm. I often think of someone, say, living in Castle Hill or, yep. or Kellyville, like they're probably living in a you know, $2 million home, mm. but to then, then move to Linfield or Roseville where your median's you know, three and a half or, or more, yeah, more yeah. Um, they need to have a big step up. So are you seeing much of that happening? It's a big upgrade for sure. Yeah, we mm. do see. We recently sold a house for $4.5 million and I know the owners, the buyers of that property sold for 2.65. Mm. So there's a, a $2 million dollar upgrade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we do see that happening regularly. Mm, yeah, okay. Mm. So bring your checkbook is what you're saying. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me more about pricing on the North Shore because mm. I think that's what our listeners would like to know. Mm. Tell me, just let's sort of unpack the market a bit here. What, what's an entry level house gonna cost? So something that, you know, just to get your toe in the market, might be on the Pacific Highway, might be run down. What's mm. sort of the lowest priced home you've seen sold in the last couple of years? Your, 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 your basic 12 square, three bedroom, one bathroom property house, that mm. is. Mm. Um, I guess there's two two different markets. Kalara Linford, Roseville. So this side of Motorville Road, yes. we always look at it. Yep. Roseville to Motorville Road, yep. you would say it's probably around the high twos. Gotcha. Yeah, 2728. Yeah. We've seen one or two down around 2450, 25. Mm. Seldom do we see that though. You've got North of Manavar Road, and you can see more transactions around the earlier twos. Mm. Okay. So really, I think you're to get into the area, you're looking early twos, yep. two to two point two. So is that like West Pimble, South Tarmara, that sort of area yeah, where it's sort of down in the north. valleys a little bit, Commonara yeah. Parkway, where it's Correct. a little bit cheaper? Yeah. Absolutely, they're yeah. down behind the Sand mm. Hospital, those yeah. areas for sure. Steep blocks in Marunga. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I know it well. Yeah, yeah, you've been there. I've been there. Yeah. So yeah, but that's yeah. that's sort of the entry point now. Okay. Um, so tell me about the midpoint of the market. So what what do I need to spend to get not not a top line home, but a mid quality four bedroom, two bath, two car home in a in a reasonable area? Four to four and a half. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's okay. jumped up. Well, mm. actually, I'll correct that. You can get in probably at the moment for around three and a half to three point eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, or say three and a half to four. Yeah. Um, you probably need to do a little bit of work to that property. If yep. you want something you can pretty much move into, mm. you're going to be north of four million. Okay. Yeah. And talk to me about the the top end of the market. I know mm. there's a big range and how long's a piece of string, but give me yeah. some examples of, of some recent prices that have been paid in say, Linfield versus Kalara versus Warunga. Because uh, so, I, I mean, yeah. there's lots. I mean, I know there's lots of samples out there, but just give me that sort of a feel. Mm. 
So top end prices have been about without tennis courts, been bouncing around that sort of seven to nine million dollar mark. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> that's in the Linfield, Clara, Roseville market. As far as tennis court properties, you can go as high up as um, you know nineteen, mm-hmm. which has been the highest sale price in Kalara, mm-hmm. recent time. Jump over Manavar Road, um, again similar in the sense of new homes, six seven million dollars. Lovely character homes in good locations can be seven to nine, mm-hmm. and there's been up to twenty for um, for a high end property, three thousand mm-hmm. plus square meters. You know, beautiful home. Mm-hmm. Um, in Warraway. Hmm. So, yeah. So I've, been through, I've actually been through the home. I was going to you bring have? it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, actually, I actually know the owner. Yep. And that, that property that sold for, what was the price? 20 points. 20.5. Mm. Unbelievable. It was on a double block, right? It was. But yeah. seven car garage, just absolutely immaculate. I mean, it was Unique. just a phenomenal home. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. You yeah. come around the corner into Cherry Street, there was one for 16, but mm. that was, again, another mm. a beautiful double story character home, mm. tennis court at the front, beautiful street frontage. You know, 16 there, um, and then around the corner there, you know, I won't boast, but my own home sold for, for you know, in Hastings Road for mm. over $8 million. Mm. Um, so there's some, mm. some pretty big numbers going around, but they are beautiful locations. Mm. Yeah. They're yeah. highly renovated homes yeah. mm. and, and great land size. How, how um, controversial is the heritage issue across mm. the North Shore? Like, I mean, a lot of people come in wanting to obliterate, donate and rebuild. Um, yeah. I mean... How much heritage overlay is in the area that's a problem for people? It's not a massive overlay. There's two, there's two sides. There's a conservation area, yep. which stops you from really doing anything with the properties, mm. which is like a cloud that sits really three to 400 metres from the train line either side of the highway, mm. in some cases, mainly east side. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the heritage listed properties. Mm. Now, heritage listed, there's, there's not a massive amount of those properties, but they're dotted in, in you know, superior streets and superior mm. locations. Mm. Mm. Now, we saw them... All right, for instance, we just sold a house in Linfield that was a heritage conservation area. Um, it was an original home. It was on a corner block and it had some trees in the backyard that were tough to get rid of. Mm. And it's, look, it scared a lot of the buyers off. Mm. It came down to a local Australian buyer who understood the process of how to renovate those sort of homes mm-hmm. that bought that home. From yeah. the Chinese community, yeah. they like to knock over and rebuild. Yeah. They get very scared of that. Mm. Um, and even high-end heritage properties, like these ones we were just recently talking about, mm. they will buy those mm. if they're done and they're ready to go, yeah. no problems whatsoever. Yeah. But okay. it ha- you know, does it have an impact? It's understanding the heritage, the nature of a heritage property, mm. and why is it a heritage property? Streetscape, is it mm. something internally? Is it local, is it state? You can usually get around it. Yeah, mm. I think a lot of buyers I'm seeing these days don't want to go down the renovation path or even the mm. rebuild path, Correct. because construction costs have gone up astronomically over the yeah. last three, four years with COVID and all the logistics problems. Um, so I, I definitely think we're seeing that. So how is that playing out in the market? Uh, what are you seeing out there? I mean, are you seeing a significant premium now paid for fully renovated homes? Or? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Like how much more would, would you estimate? Is it, again, a difficult question to answer. I would, yeah, look, on, on rule of thumb, I would say that that's gone up by 20%, wow. 20 to 25% mm. in, the last, in recent years since so, COVID. So that's an opportunity, I think, just again, for the listeners here. I'm mm. trying to uncover what do you think are the opportunities mm. in the market? And yep. If someone's a savvy buyer, they know they've got a good architect or a good, good builder or interior designer, and they can add value to a home, I'm always saying to people, buy properties with a twist. Buy mm. something where you can add value because Correct. you can manufacture that equity, and yep. if it's your own home, it's tax-free. Absolutely. Right? It's, a, it's a great opportunity to, to buy. Yeah. Mm. I think the first point there is to get the right location, right orientation and aspect, mm-hmm. and get a home that, yeah, you can always change the property. You can't change that location or aspect or, mm. or northern orientation. Mm. So if you're if you're savvy, uh, mm. yeah, you have a good reliable builder architect, and you're mm. you're competent in that process. Mm. There's an add value proposition there for yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. without a doubt. Very good. And where are you seeing prices going? I mean, get your crystal ball out for me, Matt, yeah. and uh, tell me you know which suburb I should buy in to <laughs> maximise my growth so I can retire next year. But no, look, let's let's talk about pricing. So, 2024, we've had obviously COVID has come. We had a massive price rise, then we had a correction. Uh, for the interest rate rises, where are prices going from here in 24 in the next three years, do you think? I think we'll see growth, but we'll see modest, modest growth. But we'll modest probably growth. Modest. Yeah, when I say that, I think there's, there's, there's different bands of property values. And okay. my, my guess is that up to $4 million will be very active. And I think we'll see some high levels of competition around those properties. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, you might be talking sort of 8 10% growth in that sort of sector. Mm-hmm. I think then when you go sort of five million plus in the higher end properties, I think we'll see more modest growth of probably three to six percent. Mm-hmm. But in, in a lot of cases, it can be very much property specific. Yep. Mm. You know, so like you've seen that one in Warrawee for mm. twenty point five million. Mm. 
smashed every record. And then there was another property here in Kalara that you probably were aware of that sold for 16 and resold for 19. Mm. I think we worked out on that, they made $53,000 a week. Yeah, beautiful. In the, in the ownership <laughs> period, right? Phenomenal. Not yeah. a bad return. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it is, it is. Like I always say to people, just like you've said, mm. you can't move the block of dirt. Once you've bought that location, yep. it, it's the you know classic adage in real estate, location, location, location. Get that right, yep. and that's the foundation for both raising your family, building wealth, wealth and everything else around Correct. it. Correct. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree, 100%. It's, it's so important. Mm. So, um, And there's also parts within a suburb. I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's what we call the golden triangle within a lot yep. of suburbs, right? And I yeah. think you as a local agent certainly would know which yeah. pockets and you can guide your buyers to that. Us as buyers agents, we absolutely know where to say to buyers, avoid that street, avoid that, you know. Sure, you just, you can buy there, but you know, yep. do you know that there's noisy neighbours or there's, mm. you're gonna get traffic noise, you're gonna get train noise, you yeah. know. I mean, you just gotta look anywhere along the Pacific Highway, right? Between the Pacific Highway and the train line, mm. you look at the pricing of those properties and they're always significantly lower than Correct. the properties 100 metres yeah. away, right? Correct, mm. yeah. Mm. So you go, you're exactly right. You go down a particular street here where the mm. back lines are a train line, yeah. You're 100 metres the other side, and, and there's a million dollar difference. Yeah. 200%. I mean, I bought a beautiful property just up the road here in Strickland Avenue yeah. um, a couple of years ago uh, mm. for a client. I think they paid 2.7 or 2.8. Yep. But a beautiful heritage home that, that, that mm. had been renovated but could also add some value, but had an awesome backyard. Yep. And they didn't mind, that was all they could afford. They didn't mind the train line was there mm. because they could walk the kids to school, they mm -hmm. could walk to the Linfield shops. It was absolutely perfect. Yep. And again, it was off market. Um, I just knew the local agent really well yeah. and got the deal done. You know, yeah. it, just, it was a great, great setup. Well, you're coming off different bases. So if you're coming off a baseline at Strickland Avenue, for instance, mm. of, of, mm. A, of, a, of a lesser um, entry point, and then down the road or across 100 metres down the road, it's, it's a million dollars high. You're, mm. you're just working in similar percentages. Exactly. It's yeah. just coming off a different base. That's right. So the other message I think for buyers is that, look, if you do want to get into the North Shore, you've got to buy a property that's going to fit within your budget. And as you say, you can then enjoy the capital growth ride relative to everything else yeah, that's going absolutely. on. Absolutely. Well. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about how you, you operate. How do you estimate when you've got a vendor looking to sell and mm. you're about to sign up a listing, how do you tell them what their property's worth? <laughs> Tough one, isn't it? Because you know what? Often we get it wrong. <laughs> Often we get it right. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of this comes down to, Rich, in my opinion, is sometimes a gut feel. Mm. Uh, if you understand your buyer pool and who wants to buy and what they're really looking for, what will a buyer pay for this property? Mm. Comparables are always relevant, mm. 200%, but then I do feel sometimes this comes down to a gut feel of actually understanding what people are looking for on a property and what they will possibly pay for a property like this. Mm. So now we used to track and we still do track in the sense of what do we tell the client to what we got the client. Our accuracy levels, obviously they up and down a little bit, but most of mm. the time we're, we're pretty accurate in what we get. Mm. The interesting part about valuing a property is, is the aspirational price of what could you get if everything lines up on the day. Mm. Yep. Um, and everyone, any property owner, myself included, wants to see that happen, wants to see that value mm. come into play. Yeah, yeah. But I think what we need to do is just be as sensible as we possibly can, giving them a very realistic number. Mm. This is a bankable figure that we can know that we can get two or three buyers interested in the property. Our ultimate goal here is to actually, what kind of uplift can we get by creating competition mm. at the end of the day? Yeah. You use the word realistic, and mm. that's really important for us. When we work with our clients, um, yeah. we actually track what our, we do an appraisal yep. when we've got a subject property that we're mm -hmm. buying for our client, yep. and we track what we've told the client versus what they ended up buying for it. And okay. it's somewhere around three to 4% accuracy. Yep. So um, occasionally, I mean, during COVID, we got blown out of the water because people were paying <laughs> yeah, no 10, chance. 20% above. It was ridiculous, yeah. right? Everyone just paid, because the interest rates were zero. Yes. Um, but it's interesting you talk about realism because mm. it is really important that, and we have a very honest conversation with our clients because yep. a lot of agents underquote, as you would know. They kind right. of, I mean, you're trying to create competition. I mean, you're mm. on, the selling side, we're on the buying side. And mm. you know, we're both professionals. We both come to the negotiating table with our hats on and you know, mm. swords drawn and whatever, but mm. we're professional about it. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, having a realistic conversation with your vendors, I think is mm. very important, just like we all have a realistic conversation with our, our buyers mm. and, and educate them as to what has recently transacted, even on a week to week basis. Yep. I mean, last weekend, first week, auction week, yep. how big were the numbers? Yep. It was amazing. They were great, you know? exactly. Yeah. But I think it's interesting there, Rich, is that the great thing about your side of the conversation is that you've got this one client and it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship. Mm. I guess when we go and look at property to value a property, the, the client's getting four, prop, four agents in mm. and you're going to have four very, very different valuations <laughs> on that property. Yep. Um, I won't say any more than that. And then the owner's going to have their own opinion based on what they've seen happening in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you're right, realism, and sometimes it's hard to mm. 
and we've looked back on many times where we've lost business yeah. because of price, yeah. and then where did it end up selling? Yeah, exactly right, where you said it. Right in the zone. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, disappointing to say the least. It but is. Yeah. Yeah. Realism is very much a conversation we like mm. to have. Mm. It's not about blue sky pricing. Mm. Um, it's about okay, what do we realistic think in the current market we can get? Yeah. Ultimately, the strategy we're going to try and work and get the best possible outcome. For exactly. You. Well, your job is to work for the vendor, and mm. that's that's exactly what you've got to do. So. Mm. Talk to me about some suburbs that you might consider as undervalued at the moment, Is it like that it represents good value compared to surrounding areas. Is there anything you'd highlight as an opportunity for, for the market? Look, the I think in Coringa, I know. I think it's, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's demand in every suburb yeah. um, for every type of reason. Yeah. I think if we, you know, we've got to look broader, more broader in, in Sydney. I think, look, if we go further north, perhaps the, and I think it's catching up pretty quickly though, the Thornley, the Westley, mm. and the, the Hornsby, Hornsby Heights, mm. Waitara markets, mm. I think there's going to be a push north, further north yes. into those markets, yeah. because of again, you know, if you want to be within 30 minutes of the mm. CBD, mm. you're going to pay for it. If you're happy to go another 30 minutes out or another 15 minutes out in the train, mm. there is better value property, mm. and I think we'll see those those yep. will will foster up. It is interesting because I lived in Pennant Hills for a number mm. of years when I was first married, and yeah. um, we lived in uh, yeah just about five minutes you know, walk to the station, and um, mm. yeah I'd catch the train to the city forty two minutes from Pennant Hill Station yep. through Central and Express, and it was fine, it was great. Mm. Um, but yet when I drove you know ten minutes into Barunga yep. for the same home, it was like one and a half million dollars more. Oh, totally. So you, you're absolutely right that yep. Thornley Westley Pennant Hills area is definitely good value. Yeah. Um, What's really fascinating is that I've just recently bought in the Southern Highlands, so I'm tracking down there a little bit more these days. You go down that Hume Highway yeah. and we were looking at the property values at um, Menangle Park. Yes. You know, 1.3 to 1.4 million dollars mm. for a house on 400 square metres of land, brand new, but it's it's Menangle Park. It's, it's a long it's way away. Where the skydiving centre yeah. is, right? It's <laughs> a right. long Picked way it. out. Yeah. So you yeah. look at that and go, okay, well gosh, Thorn Lee. I know. At, you know, I just sold a house in West Lee for just over 2.28 million dollars. Yeah. It was a four bedroom home with a granny flat, three bedroom yeah. granny flat. Yeah. And the granny flat was getting mm. 600 bucks a week rent. Mm. And I'm thinking, this has got to be good value. You know, I'm getting a, a, you know, yep. $2,000 a month mm. income comfortably mm. over here. Yeah. I'm getting a four bedroom home with a pool here. Mm. You know, 2.2, mm. 2.3 million bucks. Yep. That's got to go up in value. Yeah, that's like the ripple value. effect. Yeah, yeah good point. Is. Tell me about your experience in, in dealing with buyers agents. Mm. How do you think the interaction differs uh, from the experience in dealing with an ordinary buyer that's not mm. represented by a buyer's agent. How does that work for you? I think, Rich, like everything in life, <coughs> in, in this industry, there's there's people you want to work with and people that you don't particularly want to work with. So mm. for me, it's very much about the relationship with the buyer's agent and having an, an honest and trustworthy relationship that we can that, that we can work you know, mm. with in yeah. that situation. So. I, I enjoy it because I think there's transparency. You're mm. quite upfront. Mm. You've done your due diligence. You know the market, mm. um, and there's no BS there. Yeah, that's what I do like about it. Um, of course, you're trying to buy it for the least amount of money you can mm. possibly buy it for. Mm. But I think you know, in talking to buyers agents, the benefit of a buyers agent, mm. in my eyes, is number one, yeah, of course, market knowledge. Mm. Secondly, they're getting access to properties before the buyer, the mm. balance of the buyer pool, can get access to it, mm. and hopefully buying that property. Mm. Um, at a price that everyone's happy with yeah. and mm. moving on. Mm. I don't think there's this thing about, you know, I don't think in this market anyway specifically, you you can get a bargain property. Mm. Um, it's about, okay, how can we get a fair and reasonable outcome for all clients? The problem with bargains is that they're probably going to be sold at a bargain and mm. there's a reason they're a bargain. Yep. It's probably next to the petrol station yep. you know, or something wrong with it structurally. So exactly. I think you're right about one of the key mm. benefits we bring is is that, that sense of confidence that we bring to the transaction. And certainty. It's, and certainty mm. and yeah absolutely getting a property that the client likes and wants and yep. has been spending years trying to find there it is with a lot less competition if not no competition mm. and knowing they can secure it for that price that's been agreed and stacks up to that's the bank. It. yeah that's yeah, it it's certainly really important yeah. yeah it's a growing look i think your side of the business is growing and it mm. will grow mm. um like they do in america but yeah. in the mm. u.s but yeah i think it's mm. more and more people we're seeing are gravitating towards using people yeah. like yourself mm. talk to me about how the ordinary buyer treats the negotiation process with you and, and what tips would you give to buyers in how they approach sales agents? Because a lot of a lot of you know buyers come in and go, oh, I'm just going to lowball them or mm. I'm just going to give them a take it or leave it offer or they've got yeah. particular ideas in their head and just don't yeah. like dealing with that. How yeah. do you advise an ordinary buyer deal with you? Um, be honest with us. Mm. Yeah, don't work against us, work with us. Mm. I think you're right. There's this, um, there's this sort of school of thought of go low, um, you know, it's almost a standoff 
sort of scenario. Yeah. Work with us, not against us. Um, let us help you. Um, learn to trust us yeah. in what we're saying. Yeah. Um, and let's, let's just work together to get this done. So my, my path with negotiation is very transparent mm. um, and trying to make the buyer feel at ease with the process, explaining the process of how we're going to do it so mm. everyone's got a fair and ample opportunity to buy the property. Yeah. But if, if they're trying to, you know, how many times have they taken a step backwards, um, been trying to be coy or a little bit smart with their negotiations, and they've actually missed out on the property because... Mm. Mm. Um, they haven't been upfront with us and letting us know they really do like the home. They mm. want to be part of this negotiation. Mm. You know, so I'd say work with us, not against us. Yeah, I mean, when I walk into a home and mm. I know it's right for the client, I tell the client, it's a, the, the agent up front, hey, I'm actually really interested in this property. Yep. Keep me fully updated. Totally. Whereas a lot of buyers go, I'll oh, just diss the agent or I'll, I'll you know, give them the cold shoulder mm -hmm. and give them, tell them I'm semi-interested. I mean, yeah. who are you going to ring back first, right? You're going to ring me. Exactly. Right? You know, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, so, yeah, so so work with us. Let us know you, you yeah. like the property, yeah. you want to buy the property, yeah. you know, include and, us in the negotiations. And then I hear about buyers that are just disappointed. Oh, the agent never rang me back. You know, mm. I told him I was sort of interested. Well, yeah. Well, you interested or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but what, what were you putting out there, you know? Yeah. Did you make the a agent? formal offer? Exactly you know? right. Yeah. Did you tell them? Yeah. Keep me in touch. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, what do you like about being a selling agent? What's the most rewarding thing you, you get from the profession? Oh, look, I think everyone would say the journey of being a real estate agent, of helping someone buy a property. But you look, I'm just, I, I love property. Um, I believe in property. I think it's, it's a great asset class. Yeah. Um, and I like to see, you know, people get into a home that they want to be in mm. and make for their family for the next mm. five or 10 or 15, whatever the time period is, but mm. knowing that they're going to actually do well out of that property. Mm. Yeah, so it's um, mm. that's probably the most satisfying part. Awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And AI is being talked about every day of the week at the moment, prop tech. Mm. Are you adopting any of this sort of AI technology in your business so you keep up with uh, Look, everything? Uh, you know, AI, I think, is a really uh, a space that a lot of people don't understand at this point in mm. time. Yeah, we are. Look, mm. you know, there's the likes of Rita and, you know, ID for me, and which, which is probably not so much AI, but putting all these things together to getting all the information you require. Um, you know, using chat, GBT, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, look, it's out there. Mm. Rich, I'm honestly, I'm a firm believer this is a relationship game. Mm. The more people yes. we pick up the phone and talk to mm -hmm. and try and help, mm. the better we'll be. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. AI is going to be just, it'll be there in the background and help us get some information we require, but you cannot yeah. beat the one-on-one -on -one relationship with the client. It's a bit like, I was just thinking of analogies you're talking, it's a bit like the washing machine, right? Mm. When it came out, who's actually going to physically get the clothes out of the washing machine and put them on the line to dry? I mean, yes, exactly. you can get a washer dry, but it doesn't do it as well, right? Yep. So you can have all the best tech whiz gadgetry in the world in a washing exactly. machine, but someone physically has to get the T-shirt and put it on the line. Exactly. Right? So same with data, right? Yeah. You've got another, I think AI is great. We're using some pretty cool AI stuff in our business, mm. and we've got some awesome data sets to help our investor clients at the moment. But mm. at the same in time, we have to help the clients interpret that how do you apply that yep. and how do you use that to get a good result? Correct. And, it's, and then it's about, as you say, it's so important to have relationships. And I guess mm. that's one of our key value adds as a buyer's mm. agency, mm. our relationship with your agency, for example, to get access to off markets yeah. and then knowing how to pitch an offer. Yeah. So you're going to say yes and encourage your vendor to say yes versus saying oh, it's just a useless offer. Mm. Like there's a huge difference in, yeah. in knowing how that works. Yeah. I think what I found in the last six months, I've never had so many people email or call me yeah. about AI. Yeah. How I can help the business with <laughs> the AI. And it's yeah, like, okay, yeah, I yeah. get it. But um, yeah. yeah, as you're right, get, yeah. using it for data sets yeah. and, and okay, can it help us find the next seller? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah. potentially. Yeah. But I need to build a relationship with that next seller to actually have a chance of listing that property then to sell it to people yeah. like yourself. Well, I'd, I'd certainly prioritise relationship building over AI. Any that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. I've got two more questions for you. One yep. is, what's been your most memorable, intriguing or interesting sale that you can cast your mind back to? And why was wow. it intriguing? Um, very, very good question. Um, look, I guess the most intriguing, or the fun sale is when, you know, $800,000, well, in fact, sorry, one property, 2.4 million over a reserve. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. How long ago was that? This would have been uh, back in about 2015, wow. 2014-15. Roseville sale, um, for the owner, it was like literally, literally winning the lottery. Wow. Yeah, I mean, two... Uh, two buyers head to head didn't want to miss out. In fact, one of the buyers had bought a winery that morning in the Hunter Valley. There was oodles of money flowing around. Wow. The two point four million dollars over reserve wow. was astronomical, beyond our wildest dreams. Wow, yeah. that's insane. So that's probably the most intriguing. So the, the, one of the bidders just didn't want to lose face. Wouldn't lose win face it at any cost. That's wow. it. That's it. And Amazing. I've loved the property ever since. 
It's good, still there. Yeah, obviously. still there. Yeah, um, yeah. So that would be one of the most intriguing sales. And I guess, wow. you know, on the flip side is, you know, sometimes you have sales where you're done your absolute best in negotiation and someone misses yeah. and isn't happy about it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, confronts you in those sort of situations. Yeah. And you go, well, we're only trying to do, we're trying to do our best here. But mm. yeah, mm. the 2.4 wins. There you go. Mm. And lastly, what would be your best property tip that you can share with our audience today? I look as a property seller. I think presentation is number one, and investing into the the process is number two. Um, don't do it half-heartedly. Do it fully. In the area we're talking, in the, in the values we're talking here, you know, there's an ex- exponential chance of an in- a massive increase. You invest mm. into the presentation, the marketing of the property. If you get the right person negotiating on your behalf, mm. you know that investment over here will be five times mm. comfortably yeah. over mm. there. Okay. Um, so do you see people penny pinching on presentation and marketing and kind of spend, oh, I'll just spend two grand on tidying the yard up and that's about yeah, it. I, I don't know if it's no penny pinching as much or having the energy to do it. Right. <clears throat> you know, just, oh, I don't want to do that. Mm. Oh, I prefer not to have to do that if I don't have to. And decluttering as well. I'd yeah, like, yeah. you know, they think they've got the money. We get access to the money through these, you know, campaign agent and whatnot. We can easily get access to mm. the money to make it happen. Mm. In the perfect world, I would say go and rent a three bedroom apartment, move into there, leave the house with us, mm. strip it out. Yep. Let's get it looking great. Mm. Because that can make a 10% difference in the outcome. Mm. Depersonalise it. Absolutely. Get the family photos off the wall. Yeah. All that, paint it, carpet, do what you've got to do to it. Um, mm. Fix up those things that needed fixing up mm. for many, many years. Mm. And look, I, I sold my house last year, right? And mm. we got, had a small flood in, the, in those floods back in, in 2022. And it sat there for 12 months. Mm. But you know, as soon as I wanted to sell it, I could get it fixed in no time. Yeah. You know, but I should have invested and done mm. it earlier. But I would mm. say, yeah, look, mm. this is, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable asset class. Yeah. Deeper, you know, take the emotion out of it. Yeah. Get it looking great. Yeah. Because you're in competition with other properties. A, a quote I always hear is that you only get one chance to make a first impression. That's and it. I think if you know your job as a sales agent is to position the property in the right mm. way, attract the right buyers to extract the best price. That's it. And I know I walk through hundreds of properties mm. every month, and when I see one that sparkles, I go, "Wow, this is amazing!" And it creates an emotion in me that like makes me feel good. It does. Versus one that's cluttered and you know, ugly and dirty and grimy. Yeah. It's just, well, they just don't really have any it care factor. It doesn't make it feel good no. whatsoever. So. And it's about, it's first impressions count. How do you yeah. feel when you walk in that front door? Is this yeah. got the wow factor? Yeah. And you're going, mm. wow, this is a cool house. This mm. is great. They love mm. this house. Mm. So I think that's probably my tip. Mm. Excellent. Mm. Well, Matt, thank you for sharing all your knowledge today. I'm, you're welcome. I'm getting a very good first impression that you run a great business. <laughs> we try. <laughs> that you build, in, you build great rapport with your, your uh, vendors and, uh, and yeah. with your buyers. And uh, it's been a pleasure to do business with you over the years. And I uh, just want to say thank you so much for sharing your time today. And Not at uh, all. Yeah, really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks, mate. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you again for listening to another edition of the Property Buy Podcast. We look forward to connecting with you again next week. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer Podcast.